Hello everyone where you are. The American Institute is very pleased and delighted to welcome today a very great guest. This is Mr. Pekka, Oli Pekka Heinonen from Finland. Mr. Oli Pekka Heinonen is currently Director General, International Baccalaureate Organization. Mr. Heinonen was Director General of the Finnish National Agency for Education where he worked from January 2017. Mr. Heinonen had an active career in politics in Finland. He was Minister of Education and Science, Minister of Transport and Communication, and a member of Parliament. Mr. Heinonen was also Director of the Finnish National Public Broadcasting Company, before joining the Finnish Prime Minister's office in March 2011 as State Secretary responsible for organization, organizing and leading the office. He has also been responsible as State Secretary for the portfolios of the Ministry of Education and Culture, the Ministry of Internal Affairs, the Ministry of Foreign Trade and Development, and then as State Secretary at the Ministry of Finance of Finland. Mr. Heinonen will take to us, will talk to us today about the priorities for educational reforms in the future. Over to you, Mr. Heinonen. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for the invitation by Amakwen Institute to have this chance to share with you ideas about the uh, reform of educational systems and what priorities we should have for the future. If we can have the first slide, um, I would like to start by, we can go actually further with this to the next slide. We, yes. And just a second. Yes. And we can still go one more. Um, one more slide to the next, please. Thank you. Uh, I would like to start by a quote by H.G. Wells, who said that the future is a race between catastrophe and education. And I think that quote is more true today than ever, that the challenges that we are seeing in the world are such that we cannot solve those challenges without utilizing and developing our education systems, our teaching and learning. The global challenges and the national challenges are by character such that they are cultural, which means that they are kind of connected to the way that we as humans behave, act and make change. And in kind of making those changes, utilizing the human potential that there is in all of us, the education systems, of course, play a central role. Um, if we go to the next slide, uh, there are kind of one way of looking at the kind of meta tasks of education is to see that there are two meta tasks. One is to transfer the human achievements for the next generation. Everything that we have been able to create in our cultures, all the art, all the sciences, and take that and transfer it to the new generations. And the other one is 
to give those new generations capabilities to confront and make their own future. And once we lived in a world where changes weren't that big and there was a lot of kind of continuity and linearity in the world, when we took part, when we took care of the first meta task, the transferring of the human achievements, we actually automatically also gave the new generations the capabilities to confront the future. But the situation where we are today is different because we are living in a complex world, complex coming from two Latin words, com plecto, com means together and plecto means woven. So it's kind of together woven, networked world. So when we are in a kind of a network world with a lot of interdependencies, there isn't much more that kind of linearity anymore. And for that reason, it's very difficult for us to know that what are what is the knowledge and what are the skills that the future generations will be needing. And in that sense, we must, of course, still transfer the human achievements to the next generation, but we must separately take care that we give the young generations that kind of competencies that are the kind of future competencies which enable them to act and prosper with unexpected and kind of uncertain future. And so in that sense, we are in a front of a kind of a new challenge in, in all our nations. If we go to the next slide, I had a pleasure of taking part on the, or, or being at the advisory board for the World Bank, when the World Bank a couple of years ago for the first time in history made their yearly development report on education. And one of the things that kind of was studied and kind of researched at that time was the question that why is it that learning doesn't happen? Because it was noticed that during the last 15, 20 years, we have been able globally to get the children to school. And that's a hugely positive development. But what we also noticed is that once the children are in school, there is problems with learning. So, for example, uh, children haven't spent five years in school. It still might be the case that they are lacking very basic mathematics and literature skills. So there's something wrong with the way that the kind of schooling and teaching is happening. And there were kind of four pillars that were identified where the challenges were. The first one being that uh, it was noticed that the children coming to school were unprepared. So they were kind of lacking, for example, the basic um, components of well-being. And if the well-being is not there, the learning won't happen. If there are kind of things 
that are kind of worrying your health, your nutrition, your sleep, and this kind of things uh, you cannot learn. Another issue was that it was found that there was a lot of situation where the teacher force was unskilled and unmotivated, that the teacher profession was not really a something that people were looking for as a kind of a dream job. And that was shown in the quality of learning. And then there were also kind of problems with the school management. That the way that schools were run uh, didn't support teaching and learning. And also the kind of school inputs uh, were such that uh, they didn't have a positive impact on teaching and learning, they might not have kind of concentrated on the most important issue of learning at all. So these are the kind of challenges that we are faced with. If we look at the next slide, I think we must these times notice the fact that it's very clear that the COVID-19 is of course a, a health crisis but it's also a global education crisis. Because for so many children, the ability to go to school has been kind of broken down during this kind of months and year of COVID-19. Of course, there's been good solutions with kind of new technology and kind of distance, remote learning, home learning, but at the same time, there's been a lot of kind of lacks in, in kind of devices, in connectivity, in teachers' ability to utilize that kind of technology and so on. So we have been kind of suffering from a situation where the learning gap of different children seems to be widening. So those children who have good family backgrounds and who have kind of good abilities to kind of self-manage their own learning have been doing better than the children coming from more vulnerable situations. And also the ones that who would have needed the most support in their learning are the ones that have been kind of most harmed uh, by not being able to go to school. And this is something that we have to learn so much from this experience that now there's a huge challenge that how we can kind of bridge that learning gap that has been widened to understand that what is the lost learning that has happened during these years and what are the ways that we can really bridge that. Um, and, and that's kind of made the, the kind of learning crisis a bigger one than it was two years ago. If we go to the next one and we start looking at what are the kind of kind of things that we, for example, in Finland have experienced that why is it that it's more difficult in these times to make sure that the equality and equity in education is reached? What we've noticed in Finland is that equal teaching hasn't changed. Um, in, in Finland, we are very proud of our teacher education, where all our teachers have a master's level degree. And it is actually very difficult in Finland to get to study to be a teacher. 
So in some Finnish universities, only one out of 10 applicants get taken in to study to be a teacher. So we noticed that the, the equal teaching hasn't really changed. But what we are seeing is what, what has been changing is that the needs, the starting points and prerequisites of children coming to school are more diversified than they used to be. And there are very many different reasons for that. That also in Finland, we are seeing that there are kind of um, the polarization of the society um, is more shown in children coming to school that others have kind of better um, learning to learn abilities from the very start than others. And we also see that more and more children are kind of troubled with mental challenges. Again, the same issue of well-being, that if that is not there, it harms the learning. There's also the kind of questions that um, the, the kind of um, understanding of different learning difficulties has developed, which is a very positive thing. But it requires that then those kind of different needs being caused by, by kind of different learning difficulties must be taken care um, kind of by developing more personalized learning path. And, and this is a kind of a huge challenge to the traditional way of looking at education. And if we go to the next slide, there you can see that the traditional way of creating education system is to base them on equality, kind of giving everybody the same and kind of everybody is moving from one class to the next one, um, kind of with, with, with uh, as they kind of get one year older and, and everybody kind of follows the same path. But with the more diversified needs, uh, we have to be able to um, develop and reform our education systems to be based more on equity, making sure that you take into consideration the different needs of different learners and tailor the learning to those needs. And of course, that's something that challenges the way that the whole education systems are run. So there should be kind of more flexibility in the system to accept that different children might uh, develop with kind of different time space. And also that the teachers must be able to move to more personalized learning. And that's a, it's a very challenging issue. And therefore the kind of question that teachers really have the high education and training and retraining becomes even more important. If we go to the next slide, this is a, a kind of a summary of a work that Finland has been involved with five other countries who are doing pretty well in the OECD visa rankings. And OECD has been involved in this work also. And in that work, we have been trying to um, crystallize that what are the building blocks 
that need to be in place in order a functioning education system to be on a high quality level. And there are six such components. A high quality curriculum is one of them. The other one is that there are kind of informative assessment procedure that support learning. And that there is a supportive learning ecosystem, meaning that the different layers in the education system, the national, the regional, the local municipality level and the school level, they are all aligned with each other. And also that the collaboration um, in with, with these uh, different actors is functioning well. And then the comprehensive student support, which should be something that each student uh, has the possibility to take use of, meaning that with that comprehensive student support, we can meet the individual learning needs of each child. And of course, on doing that, I think there are good kind of technological and digital possibilities that can help teachers on achieving this. And then there is a component of the strong leadership of learning. I think it's very, very central that we are able to create schools as learning communities, a kind of um, centers of, of kind of uh, communities of practice where the teachers are also supporting each other, that the kind of peer-to-peer -peer support, review and help is there. And that requires that there is strong leadership in those schools. Uh, of course, administrational leadership, but also pedagogical leadership. Um, and, and, and that means that the kind of uh, training and retraining of teachers is an essential part of those schools to be developed. And last but not least is the highly effective teaching that how to make sure that teaching is a, an attractive career. And also that how the teachers have the ability to utilize the newest research. So for that reason, the master's level education is very important that through their education, the teachers also understand research and are able to utilize and include it as part of their own teaching. In Finland, the teachers have a lot of autonomy and that is something that it's possible because of the high level of education. And that means that also the teachers are responsible of that uh, development of their own pedagogical solution. And I think that what really makes a high quality education system is the fact that these six components align together. So if there are changes in the curriculum that is taken into consideration in the way that schools are run or how teachers are educated or how the kind of learning ecosystem um, is kind of adapting to the changing, changing curriculum. And, and this is the kind of what we found out 
in this study that we did with OECD was that why was it that very different countries, different type of societies, all had kind of good learning outcomes in PISA results. And we found out that these six components could be organized and implemented in a very different way in these countries. But the thing that was common was the alignment with these six building blocks of the education system. So to kind of conclude with, if we move to the next slide, I think that what we need is that we need to strengthen the systemic, the holistic approach when we are reforming our education system. So school subjects will be important in the future too. But we have to be make sure that the knowledge and skills that are is taught in those subjects can also be turned into competencies. Meaning that it's not only the thing that uh, the, the students know, but what becomes more important is what they can do with, the, with what they know. That they have the combination of knowledge, skills, values, attitudes that kind of together sum up as competency. Uh, we must make sure that we are not only teaching kind of individual students, but we also are teaching uh, the kind of community capacity. We are kind of making sure that the teaching and learning is not only a kind of individualistic approach, but it, it, is a, it is a kind of a community of learning that happens in schools. And I think that's what we have learned very strongly during the COVID-19, understanding that um, kind of studying from home is very difficult when we are trying to teach the children for example, the kind of social and emotional skills, the kind of democratic skills working as part of the school community. And, and, and this is kind of um, something that we must take as a learning from the, from the pandemics. Um, then it's not enough also, not only to kind of concentrate on the school-based learning, but we have to uh, be able to create the path for lifelong learning and for ubiquitous learning, utilize learning environments that go beyond the school walls, and also make sure that we give the young generations the lifelong learning uh, capability. It's important that we do not kind of uh, divide the kind of human uh, approach to different sectors, but again, that we see a human being as a whole with a growth mindset, always kind of supporting the idea of having new possibilities to learn. With the teachers, as I said, the kind of uh, schools as learning communities becomes important and also that the schools are not doing their kind of growing and educating work alone, but other services, kind of non-governmental organizations, voluntary organizations, kind of hobby organizations are connected with a kind of child and youth-centered services. And finally, it's very important that in the future also we bring and, and kind of give our children the national identity, the cultural heritage that all our nations have. And at the same time, 
it's important that they understand the global consciousness, understanding the planetary kind of limits that there are so obvious for us in the climate change, for example, in today's situation, and also kind of help them grow into a kind of a global ethical thinking. And just my last slide, kind of trying to crystallize it, I think we have to make sure that we always put the learning in the center and that we assess learning, have the research in place that what is the thing that supports learning and what are the hinders for learning. And then we must act on that evidence to make the schools the really kind of centers of excellence of learning for all learners. And then to align all actors in the society to support this task, to make the whole system work for learning. And I think this is not a kind of a silver bullet for education systems to develop. This is a process that takes time, but I think this is the fastest way to make sure that our future is not a catastrophe, but it's a future of a learning society. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Heinonen, for this very interesting and relevant presentation, which allowed us to learn a lot of things based on your rich and great experience in the conduct of educational reforms. And now is question time. We have received a lot of questions but since we only have 30 minutes left, we will focus on few. The first question, you have two official languages, Finnish and Swedish, and English is the lingua franca in the world. What is the place of each languages as learning language in your educational system? Yes, thank you very much for the question. Uh, the, the kind of role of these different languages in our education system is such that every child starts with his or her own mother language. And then there is uh, the kind of the, the other national language is also an obligatory language for all children. And that usually starts from the third or fifth grade. Um, we in Finland, we start with the first foreign language, usually on the third grade. And the parents can choose what that first language will be. So there's kind of, of course, different schools and different municipalities have kind of different possibilities to um, offer the alternative of languages, but usually they can be like English, German, French, Spanish, Italian, uh, Russian, uh, and and then it's up to the uh, parents to choose. But it, a fact is that the majority of the parents choose English. So the role of the English language is very strong in Finland, and we've done a lot of work to make sure that we could 
strengthen the role of the other languages in also in Finland. Because we are a small country and knowing um, different languages is very, very important to us because we are an open society, very dependent on our expert. And, and, and for that reason, kind of language capabilities are, are essential for us. Another question, uh, Mr. Heinonen. Could you please tell us on the state of progress of the development and perspectives of higher education and their disciplinary aspects in Finland? Uh, it's a very good question too. Um, I think that what we are seeing is uh, because you can look at it from kind of very different uh, different perspectives, but if you look at it from the student's perspective, in today's situation, uh, students have much, much more possibility to choose parts of their studies from different uh, faculties. So they can kind of make combinations kind of interdisciplinary combinations of their studies much, much more uh, than previously. Um, and also, uh, otherwise, I would say that um, the, the kind of interdisciplinary aspect has become much, much more stronger in Finland in that sense that um, it's been understood that there's a lot of kind of valuable things happening between the different disciplines and and kind of giving um, capabilities for students to combine and have combination of, of different disciplines is seen something that is very valuable. We had in Finland a, a, a kind of quite a big merger of three different universities to one university, which where the University of kind of Arts and Design, the University of Economics and the University of Technology. And in that combination, um, it was really the, the kind of basic idea to be able to put the kind of technological components, the, the economical thinking and the kind of artistic creative thinking together to be able to create something new. Another question, in terms of input, how would your, you personalize learning to reach equity? Would you opt for personalized programs? Uh, yes, uh, good question again, uh, no. Uh, I would not, because uh, the, the challenge with kind of personalized programs is the challenge that uh, kind of you might end up in a situation where you kind of create different routes for different children that kind of become their identity, that others are better and others are kind of worse. So I do support the idea that kind of basically everybody is doing the same program, but we are increasing the flexibility inside that program a lot. And you can have kind of different groupings for a while to kind of help and support with different needs of learning, but you don't make them kind of permanent programs. And of course, as I said, that's something that it's kind of maybe very challenging for the teachers. And what we are also doing in Finland is that we sometimes kind of 
combine uh, classes to together in order that there is a kind of a larger group of children in the same group and there are kind of like three teachers with them and then they can more flexibly kind of divide the group so that they can support each one's kind of personalized learning needs. Um, and that we are, I would say that we are kind of all the time in Finland, for example, learning these different pedagogical solutions that how this should be done. Um, and, and as we have also in Finland, uh, kind of put the idea of inclusion of kind of children with difficult learning difficulties to come to the same groups also, there's a need for kind of support personnel in that type of, of situation. Another question, how autonomous the school could be and being respectful to the national guidelines and unity? Mm. That's a difficult question. Um, I think that because the, the kind of national, as what we call in Finland, core curriculum, it should set the aims of learning. What are the things that each student should learn during those years of schooling? And by kind of setting those shared goals, then you also set what is the kind of national um, kind of shared level that everybody should reach and also have the right to kind of um, the, the right to, to be uh, part of in, in their education. But then when we come to the question that how those aims are met, what are the methods, what is the kind of pedagogical solutions then we see that the schools and the teachers should be very autonomous. And, and in Finland, we kind of make two levels of curriculums. We have the national core curriculum, and based on that, the municipalities and the schools, they make their own local curriculum where they kind of make decisions of quite many things, also taking into consideration the local circumstances. Um, when we talk, when we use the word autonomous, it, I feel that it's quite often kind of misunderstood because sometimes we say that if somebody has a lot of autonomy, that actor doesn't have to take others into consideration. Uh, but, but kind of our thinking is quite the opposite. Our thinking is that the more autonomy you have, the more you must be connected also what the others are doing. And in that sense, we come to the question that how important the factor, the trust is in the system that there is trust between the national level, the local level, the school level, the teachers, and actually that that trust goes all the way to the students. And by trust, I mean kind of three components. The, the component of being um, credible, that you have the ability to bear the responsibility that you have. The component of reliability that you keep up what you promise to do. And the third component is the closeness of different actors, the intimacy between different actors in the system 
so that they know each other's reality in a way that they, in a way, breathe the same air. They know that what are, like, for example, on the national level, they know what are the challenges on the school level and the teacher level. And the teachers and the schools can kind of rely on the fact that the national level knows that what we are struggling for, and for that reason, we can trust that they are trying to do their best to help us succeed in, in our teaching and learning. And, and with, a, with, a, with a kind of a system of a lot of autonomy, autonomy in it, the interaction between different actors becomes the centerpiece. And trust is the kind of main quality of those interactions. What is the place of homework for students in the Finnish curriculum? Um, well, we, we do have homework in Finland also. And of course, the amount of homework increases when the students get older. Um, but which is shown also in the OECD, OECD statistics, the amount of homework in Finland is one of the lowest in OECD countries. Because we want to make sure that the, the students have also other things in their life that just studying, that they have time to be part of their family, they, they, they have time to hobbies, they have time to relax, they have time to be with their friends. Because those, all those things are also important when we are thinking about learning and well-being. And we want to make sure that we can kind of combine the idea of kind of competitiveness with the well-being, that we can reach both of those on an individual level, on a community level, and also on the national level. What do you think about the idea that says the most important for an educational system is to success to give people qualification to enter the labor markets? Um, well, I, I think it is important that the education system is able to adapt and understand the changing demands of the labor market. But I have a I have a few kind of reservations on on that that would be the kind of most important part of an education system. Because I think the most important part of an education system is to help the students to flourish in their lives. And once they are able to flourish in their lives, they will also find meaningful doing and also work that supports the whole community. Another issue that I have a reservation here is the fact that there's a bit of an idea that the, the education system is a kind of a factory, that you put the children at the other end in, and then they spend a certain time in schools, and then they kind of come out and graduate and are kind of right on, have all the skills and capabilities to enter the labor market. 
Um, I think that we, it is important that we give our students also the abilities to change the labor market. That it doesn't only go that way that we kind of mold our students to fit the labor market. But I think that we have to be able to give the students the capabilities of them molding the labor market to be more uh, effective to kind of create better products, increase the productivity of the labor market and do that all of that uh, also, again, taking into consideration the well-being of uh, individuals. When the educational decision maker wants to reduce class sizes and he does not have sufficiently trained teachers, can he make the decision to recruit untrained people? Um, well, well, that's a uh, that's a kind of a question that I would not like to be in the position of having to answer that question because it's a, it's a very, very, very difficult, difficult question. Uh, um, I, I, I would say that, uh, of course, what is important is that the learning happens and then I would kind of for a short time uh, kind of be willing to recruit untrained people if at the same time there's the possibility to take care of their education and training um, to kind of more master the the challenges of teaching and uh, learning because it's also a question that, that again that how we build the system because there's a danger that um, with the untrained teachers um, it might end up with a situation where the motivation and attraction of the teacher profession doesn't grow stronger. And that is something that I think should be kind of done to make sure that teachers are valued by the community. And we come back to the trust issue, that the one component of trust is the credibility that people are able to bear the responsibility that they are kind of trusted with and with untrained teachers that's the challenge that does that happen how important is governance in the success of reforms i think governance is very central that uh, the way, because I think we know that it's possible to create kind of high quality classrooms or high quality individual schools. But what is the most challenging thing is how you create a high quality education system like for example, a national system. And that is not possible to happen if you don't have a good model of governance in place, where the kind of responsibilities are clear, where there are clear roles and kind of clear processes, how the development work is done clear accountabilities, room for innovation and development. And it, 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 is, a, it, it is a big issue to, to kind of being able to create that. 
and and we need to have kind of a systemic and systematic approach on doing that we can not only think that it's the kind of government that from top down has the right answers that what should be done on the school level or in a classroom but it is a system in that sense that all the actors again are connected to each other and there must be a learning loop in the system so that it kind of includes the ability to adapt constantly to changing circumstances and it would be better if there would be kind of learning loops on on many levels and when we're talking about teaching and learning it's very important that there would be kind of small learning loops uh, in schools with teachers because the smaller the learning loop is the faster it is to adapt to the changes happening in the society the the bigger learning loops they usually take much much more time to be able to adapt What is your vision regarding the evolution, whether it is of the education system, teachers or learners? Yes. Uh, I think... Uh, well, again, I'm kind of reflecting from the Finnish experience. Uh, and, and the Finnish experience is that... Uh, we don't have really kind of national assessment and tests uh, not at all until the end of secondary general education. That's the kind of first national assessment test that there is in Finland. Because we want to make sure that the that because there's a danger with the tests that it's kind of learning to forget that once the test is passed you can forget everything but we would like to achieve a model of a kind of a deep learning where the learned issues become part of the identity of the students so it is something that is connected to their being as a human and in that sense kind of kind of lives with them as they live their lives uh, on the education system level we have to have knowledge on where the education is going so we need evaluation uh, which is something that uh, that kind of is research based and it gives the feedback for the policy making to make evidence based decisions but again it's not something that it's it's an assessment of individual uh, learners about teachers uh, we don't have that type of evaluation in Finland at all. Because as I said, we try to make care of that with the high level of, of, of master's level education for the teachers, for them to be accountable and responsible of the work they are doing and de developing it also. And it's a trust issue also that we are doing it that way. Because otherwise you end up with a system that you start kind of creating kind of uh, different types of performance, key performance indicators and all that to uh, teachers. And it, it's, it, it doesn't really function that way with teaching and learning. Because there are so many important things that you cannot measure on a teacher's work. And if you try to measure certain aspects, then those aspects 
will be kind of um, have have all the focus, and the other aspects that cannot be measured kind of are set aside, and that's definitely something that we don't want to see in Finland. The last question, do you not ask uh, him about the weaknesses and strengths of the Finnish educational system? What, what are your weaknesses in the Finnish educational mm -hmm. system? Mm -hmm. Yes, it's a good question. I would say that the biggest weakness in the Finnish education system is that, that I think there's a danger that that we in Finland become kind of prisoners of our own success in education. Meaning that we are seeing that we are doing well in international comparisons, that we, we kind of become afraid of making any changes in the system and we stop developing it. The Finnish education system has not always been with high quality. It is a result of development work and reforms that have lasted kind of tens and tens of years. And if we don't continue with reforming our, our system and developing it constantly, uh, it will not be a high quality system in the future. So I would say that that's the biggest challenge that we have. We are coming to the end of the time allotted for our webinar. Thank you very much, Mr. Heinonen, for your valuable participation in this webinar. And I hope to welcome you very soon. Thank you very much and thank you for this ability and looking forward to continuing the collaboration and learning together about the future solutions for teaching and learning. Thank you. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Goodbye.